All right. I think we can, we're going to begin. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. My name is Andrew B. Campbell, a.k.a. Dr. ABC, and I am an assistant professor teaching stream of racial justice in teacher education here at OISE and, and the Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning. And I'm also a member of the OISE Black Faculty Caucus, which is the group responsible for this fantastic event now in, its, in our fourth year. It is my honor this year to serve again as the event coordinator. And tonight, the voices you will hear will be that of our Black women. And so I just want to say thank you for all persons showing up in the space. Someone's mic is on. Somebody's mic is on. And just thank you for all of us showing up in the space. At this time, I'm going to be inviting to do our grounding for us. We have the privilege of having Gillette Allen, Black therapist, community activist and professor of community and social justice services at Umber College. Gillette Allen, it's over to you. Thank you, Andrew. So I just want to say thank you for inviting me as we continue to celebrate African Heritage Month um, to be here this evening to do the grounding um, for this event. Hoping that folks are well planted where they are and are touching the ground um, where, wherever you're participating from. It is very important that we feel very nourished by the very ground that we're standing on. And as we're doing this grounding, it's very important that we're reflective on whose land we're on this evening. And so when we're grounded, it is really good because we feel very safe. We're able to give our attention, be present, be able to think clearly, process the information that's gonna be shared with us this evening and most importantly, to bring some good positive vibes into the space tonight. And so this evening, as we ground ourselves in this virtual space to listen and learn from these esteemed panelists of Black women in academia, we wanna honor their achievements, acknowledge their leadership and impact. But in doing so, we cannot not reflect on the challenges Black women are facing in the academic space as they fight to foster and foster and um, for change um, in an environment where we need to be seen for our courage, wisdom, and brilliance. Anti-Blackness is not new in academia, and the misogynoir that the unique form of discrimination that Black women face is persistent and pervasive in academia. And so to ensure that the conversation is rich and fulfilling this evening, we want to pull on and center the strength of our ancestors not just any ancestors. We wanna call in the space our warrior black women. Facing adversities and obstacles is nothing new for us, but we always managed to be resilient and did what we had to do despite the challenges. I hope this evening, the women who are here to um, pour knowledge into us, continue to follow closely in the footsteps of those warrior women who came before us. Those warrior women who fight with slave traders on the African continent and continue to do so in the diaspora. And so this evening, I want to call on Dinkanish, the Eve of us all, the mother who created us all. I want to call on Ya Asantua from Ghana, who became famous for commanding the Ashanti kings in the War of the Golden Stool against the British colonial rule. I want to call on Nihanda from Zimbabwe, one of the leaders of the Chimarenga uprising in the 1890s against the British South African company under the leadership of Cecil John Rhodes. I wanna call on our ancestor, Queen Nzinga, who stood up to European colonizers and did her best to protect her people from the evils of the Atlantic slave trade. I wanna call on her sister, Marianne Chad, who founded Canada's first anti-slavery newspaper, The Provincial Freeman. This publication encouraged Blacks to immigrate to Canada. I want to call on our sister, Rosemary Brown, who introduced legislation to remove sexism and racism from BC's education curriculum. And I want to call on Marie-Joseph Angelique, 
and enslaved women in Canada who used arson as a tool of resistance commonly used by enslaved Africans throughout the length and breadth of the Americas. And finally, I want to call on my sister Sharona Hall, who is a near and dear friend to me, a sister, a mother, a friend, a dreadlock feminist activist, fearless and relenting warrior, who fight for the rights of the Black community inside and outside the system and was a Jamaican immigrant in this country for many, many years. And finally, let's ground ourselves in Mother Earth, Aseseya, who gives us so much, but who we continue to destroy. And so I hope this evening we are enriched and nourished by the knowledge that these women are gonna pour into, our, pour into us and I want to say, Ashe, 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 it is good. Thank you so much, Professor Ali. Thank you so much. If there's anything I learned from grounding, it's the power of grounding. And I just want to say, my first experience of grounding and pouring libation happened at the University of Toronto. And it happened when Professor Joki won came into a session and did that. I will never forget that. I will never forget. I've spoke about it many times. And from you, Professor Jokiwan, I have learned the power of libation, the power of grounding. And I'm so honored to have someone like Juliet Allen, who is part of my tribe and I'm a part of her tribe and can ground us like that. Thank you so much. We move right along. We welcome our doctoral student from LHA East and also a GA and the Center for Excellence, Center for Black Studies at OISE, Merva Hutchinson, to do the land acknowledgement. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. It is my pleasure to be here tonight with everyone. And I'd like to do this land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're followed by another, um, um, a PhD candidate, Tanita Monroe, who will be doing the ancestral acknowledgement. Tanita, over to you. Thank you. Um, so we acknowledge the indigenous Africans who were forcefully removed from their native lands and dispersed across the new world. This involuntary migration heavily contributed to the movement of African descendant people across the African diaspora to places like Canada. It is imperative that we think deeper about the processes that led to the dispossession of indigenous people on this land and settler colonialism. We must examine how these same processes displaced and forcibly remove indigenous Africans from their lands to exploit their labors in European imperial endeavors to create a new world. Stolen people on stolen land. What we are confronted with today are the vestiges of the transatlantic slave trade, what Dr. Sadia Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery. In entering a conversation about anti-Black racism, it is important to center the humanity of Black children and Black families and to examine systems such as the education system that act upon them. And this was written by Dr. Natasha Henry Dixon, historian, professor at York University and um, former president of the Ontario Black History Society and educational consultant. Thank you so much, Danita Monroe, who is also a senior researcher um, coordinator there at in the TDSB um, in general and also very specific at the Center for Excellence for Black Student Achievement. And I had the honor of taking my students here from OISE to the Center for a field trip. And it was amazing. So I want to say thank you to everyone for the work you're doing. The only thing I'm sad about tonight is that I can't be in the space with community because I feel the energy. Every time I look at the number, the number is not what moves me. I feel the presence of community. And I know so many persons who are in the background, who are online, you are in your homes. You are community. And I thank you so much because without community, who are we? <laughs> who are we without community? Who are we without community? That is something maybe for us to think about because we are not much. 
without community and connection. I want to call one of the powerful community members of the Oise family, especially the Oise Black Caucus, who is going to bring our official welcome and some open remarks connected to our research. And that put peace um, I'm handing over right now to Professor Joe Kiwan, who will bring in the Oise welcome and open remarks. Professor Wan, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. MBC, if you allow me to call you that way, for inviting me to occupy this very important uh, space of welcoming everybody and greeting them with, with the ancestral greeting of Af people of African ancestry. I just want to touch base just a little bit in terms of the presence of black women leaders through times and space. And I just want to ensure that I don't take a lot of time. I just want to mention briefly, and I want to thank Dr. Alan for mentioning some of the names I was going to mention, grounding us within our ancestral heroes and uh, sheroes. I want to talk a little bit about the Canadian leadership, and she mentioned some of those people. And then I want to ground my final remarks in grounding or connecting the dots between history, Canadian, you know, African history, Canadian women history, and the contemporary research that I'm engaged in. You know, just to name a few people that were mentioned, I want to acknowledge them and I want to tell you, when we talk about black women in leadership, it did not just start the other day. Black women have been in leadership since antiquity, since time immemorial. Zing, Queen Nzinga, Queen, Queen Makenda, Queen uh, Amina, Queen uh, Navititi, Queen India Benin, Queen Moremi, Queen Rana, Rana Volona of Madagascar, Queen Muhumuza of East Africa, Uganda, Queen Ya, as you said, of Ghana. So, and then I want to mention within the Canadian history and uh, contemporary, the, the, the queen, the, the women of cloth, the church women who are not even acknowledged as leaders of our community, but who made sure as they trying to settle in the cold Canadian winters, they provided the community with food and clothing. Uh, you mentioned Merichard, the first woman to come up with, uh, um, you know, with, uh, with a newspaper. When I met the granddaughter, great granddaughter, when I was doing my research on Black Canadian feminisms, she actually gave me a newspaper that was of 18, 15, 1895. So you can actually see how far we have gone into leadership. Catherine Apekwekwe, I've always mentioned her, who started the first log school in Nova Scotia because of segregation. I want to mention, we all know about Viola Desmond. We, you know, I don't know if you know about Anne Coase, Rosemary Brown has been mentioned. We have um, a leader like Katie Beauregard. We have Doreen Lewis. We have Yvonne Atwell. We have James, the first black minister in Quebec. We have Honorable May Anne Francis of Nova Scotia. We have, you know, Michelle, uh, Honorable Ref uh, Reftenant Michelle. We have, you know, Senena Kande. We have Honorable Jen, uh, Jean uh, Augustine, and we have even our own MPs like Shemaine William of uh, of uh, in, in Durham. There are many, and I can go on and on, just to show that when we talk about Black women in leadership, we have always been leaders in our communities, even if we did not get the acknowledgement. So I, I want to pull together you know, that leadership and the leadership of women I've looked in the academy and what motivated me when I came to Canada many years ago, uh, 30 plus years ago, was to find a center as a black woman from the continent. And um, the reason why I needed to find a center was because there wasn't putting together of the many heroic work that had been done by black women of African ancestry. And working at the university, I couldn't help but find myself floating without a center. And I do remember wandering around and my first gathering that I had of black women was in 2000 and two, actually 2000 within the department at that time used to be socio, um, uh, sociology of equity studies. And um, more recently, the, another organizing 
uh, space I organized for Black women with the help of one of my students was in 2016 when uh, and Dr. Lopez was there, when we had over 100 Black women. And again, we were talking, we were talking, and you could actually see the tensions. So what I decided to do was to address the gaps. And one of the things I did was to come up with, uh, with uh, you know, as I said, um, a research on Black black feminisms, having conversation across Canada on black feminisms. And in the process of doing that, I also came up with, uh, with a course on black feminist thoughts because there was none within, within the academy. And more recently, based on my work with the uh, advisor of um, you know, status of women, I realized how absent black women in leadership were. And I constituted a course on black women in lead, no, women in leadership positions. And uh, following that, I came up with a research on black um, women in, in the academy because I thought I should situate, situate my research on that. Now, let me collapse the contemporary and the history and say what was amazing was the commonalities between space and time in terms of the conceptualization of women of antiquity and contemporary women. They conceptualized it holistically. They tried to theoretically ground whatever they were doing. They were very involved in terms of commitment to their, play, to their place of work, commitment to their nation, commitment to their communities. They were very, very grounded in collective organizing. Very, very interesting. And the, interestingly, most of the women I talked to did talk about spirituality, grounding themselves in spirituality because they felt without spirituality, they were nowhere. And I, I'll, I'll give you a quote. It is something that is political in nature. I have to challenge it because I'm called to challenge, to challenge whatever, whatever is happening in my place of work, my community, my spirit. The work that I do is in line with my spirit, my guide. I am never, never alone. And that allows me to ground myself very confidently. It's rooted in my ancestry. This thing is called blood memory. It resonates with me. And looking at the women of antiquity, they all had a temple. All those women that I mentioned and that Dr. Allen mentioned, they all used to have a temple. They all used to have a place for, for worship. And then the other thing that, uh, you know, the, the women of antiquity and the, the contemporary women talked about is the gaslighting because it made people, it made the women feel guilty. But they said, this has always been going on for centuries. You know, whether we are the women of antiquity or we are the contemporary women, it's part of our ancestry. We are always, there is always gaslighting. And uh, last but not least, in terms of the con you know, commonalities of the women of antiquity and the contemporary women that I talked to, together with the women in between of, within the Canadian history, visionaries, there was a lot of hope, both from the antiquity and contemporary. A lot of humanity, we grounded, we grounded and they grounded their way of seeing the humanity, the umputu that we evoke the philosophy from the South African, um, South African uh, part of Africa. And then they were constantly jumping through hoops. And this was both antiquity and the contemporary. And the interesting thing was they always wanted to disrupt. I still remember Queen Amina, how she was being challenged. And she did not hesitate to get rid of some of the people who are challenging her. And I see, interestingly, when I was talking to women who were interviewed in, the, in my research, they did exactly the same. If you could not, if you could not see that the essence of what you're doing had meaning at all, they did not uh, hesitate to alienate themselves from you. In conclusion, there is no conclusion because we must keep the upholding of our ancestral of our ancestors work on leadership. Let's look at the gaps. Let's, you know, all those women we have mentioned, not, not much has been written. When I was putting together my literature on women in leadership, black women in leadership positions in the academy, there was not a single article within Canadian landscape. There was a lot of literature within uh, in the Americas, but there was one article that was looking at leadership of black and Asian, Asian women. And I said, no, that cannot go on. So I'm challenging myself and I'm 
telling you that we need to challenge the colonization that has kept us apart, that don't give us a chance to to write, uh, to constantly write. So in other words, what I'm advocating as we open this conversation is to rupture the dissonance that was created by colonization and continues to reproduce itself among us, colonized subject. We need to constantly know our history. And I'm so glad that the, the, the Toronto District School Board has advocated to teach a course on black history for me, that was a celebration when I read it in the newspaper. We need to re-educate ourselves. We need to situate ourselves in our history. And we need to document, document, document our stories. We need to document our stories. And when I talk about women, Black women in leadership, I'm not talking about appointed leadership. We have leadership within our communities. We have women who have done heroic work in our communities. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for giving me this opportunity to share my few words. Thank you so much, Professor Wan. You can see the love going up. And before the loves are start going up, my words, funny enough, the word that came to me was one of our great black singers, Anita Baker, when she says, you bring me joy. That's the most powerful thing that came into my heart when I heard you, when I heard you talking you brought me joy and the challenge was joy and you can see from the audience reaction that there is that they have accepted your challenge but there's also a level of joy that comes from it and i'm going to tell you something i was writing some notes and i said no i don't need to write i'm going to get the recording because the recording will be on youtube everybody everyone by next week and that section when you are calling and naming black women and talking about the contribution, I need that section to, rem to, for, to use in my class to remind our students. So thank you so much, Professor Wan. Thank you, absolutely. At this time, we're gonna move right along. We have, a, before we get to the panel, in another 10 minutes, we'll get to the panel. In 10 minutes time, we have a special, special section coming up. And I, we're gonna be spotlighting and highlighting black women within OISE and outside of OISE, within our community who has showed up just to say something. I am so happy to have these black women in the space. And we are gonna start with them right now. And we start with Dr. Beverly Jean Daniel, and then we move on to the others. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to be spending this time with you, Andrew. Thank you for the invite, my love. Um, so, you know, when Andrew asked me to, to speak for two minutes, I thought, what, what is the main message that I, I would love for my sisters and everyone else to, to hear? Um, and the word that just kept coming to me is grace. How can we offer each other grace? Uh, how can we recognize the ways in which these uh, systems of oppression continue to pit us against each other, which then informs or impacts how we engage with each other? And we often get caught up in these um, these emotional entanglements wherein which we think we can't support each other. We think we can't trust each other. We think we can't be present for each other because we've gotten caught in this, this cycle of thinking that we have to permanently compete against each other. Um, and in the process of competing against each other, we engage in behaviors and practices that serve to tear each other down and to minimize each other and to hurt each other while the system continues to benefit, while other players in the system continue to benefit. So I am urging all of us to offer each other grace, to offer each other care, to offer each other love. Because if we can create a support system for each other where we can rely on each other, we can trust each other, we will be unstoppable. So I, th I think, you know, what, what does grace look like? Um, grace looks like being willing to say hello. I am, I am taking this call from the Bahamas and I'm not sure how stable my, my internet is, but I have been breathing for the past week because everybody is saying hello to me. And I think of the many times in Toronto where I see sisters and brothers who look like me who don't say hello or who know me but won't say hello, right? So how do we say hello to each other? How do we greet each other 
in a way that says, I see you for the human being that you are. I see you for the bright light that you are. I see all the potential that you have in you. And I love you because of your potential. That your potential does not minimize me. That your potential becomes a light for me to follow. It is not something that is going to minimize my light. So grace to me is about how do we connect all of our individual spots of light and create a beam that is so bright and so strong and so united that nobody can dim the lights of any one of us, because if you try to dim one light, it means you have to put all the lights out. And grace means you cannot shut us down. We are here. We're going to shine brightly. So in my two minutes, please, let's learn how to offer each other grace. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Good evening, my esteemed Sisters, Dr. Lopez, Dr. Buford, Dr. Lomafu, Dr. Tucker, Dr. Green, and can I say to Dr. Daniel, amen and amen. And my esteemed sisters, you are phenomenal. Though you carry the weight of injustice, oppression, and racism on your shoulders, you do not stagger. I'm reminded of the words of bell hooks. Sometimes, People try to destroy you precisely because they recognize your power, not because they don't see it, but because they see it and they don't want it to exist. Dear sisters, you are phenomenal. The blood that runs through your veins is strengthened by the ancestors and it informs your great wisdom, your brilliance, scholarship, it cannot be denied. You are mothers, protectors, teachers, scholars, and leaders. Because of all of you, I am. Without you, I could not have my name, Dr. Wendy Mackey. It is because of you, phenomenal women. When you are feeling the weight of your grand purpose, remember you are not alone. As Dr. Wayne has stated, you are not alone. We are all sisters. We are here to uplift you. We are here to hold you steady and we are here to defend you. Thank you, sisters. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be in this space with you. And Dr. Daniel took the words right out of my mouth. Um, when I heard about you know speaking today, briefly, I thought about the way that the pursuit of Black excellence is killing us. And I want us as Black women, you know, the, my message is, let us be really mindful of the way that we're showing up for some of us and um, in ways that exclude or alienate some of, some, some of the others of us. Um, how these arbitrary hierarchies, merit, meritocracy, competition, and ego pits us against each other or have us unwittingly sort of weaponizing and embodying whiteness. Be mindful of who we celebrate, why and for what, right? And, and who, again, we are excluding in those, in those, in those celebrations. For, for me, I feel like, you know, if there isn't space for all of us, then there, there should be space for all of us, then it really isn't a space for any but any of us. And so we need to show up for ourselves and each other in ways that push us all forward. And again, the showing up for ourselves is really important. Um, boundaries are really important. And I think that as black women, a lot of us struggle with that, including myself. So thank you. Thank you so much for those beautiful words that we have just heard from um, the sisters before me. This is a message of gratitude to the black women who have loved, nurtured and educated me as only black women can. I was born and raised into a community of beautiful black women, my mother, sisters, sisters-in-law, aunts, 
cousins, many aunties, sister friends, all brilliant and brave, fabulous and flawed, smart and sassy. At high school and teacher's college in Jamaica and graduate school at OISE, I was educated by black women, passionate and poised, scholarly and spirited, caring and compassionate. I persevere in my calling as an educator because they have paved the sometimes windy, bumpy, overgrown, blocked pathways. These black women scholars have been clearing it and planting seeds as they go. My gratitude is not without action. I teach, mentor, coach, volunteer, hold space for myself and other black women to grow and heal, rest and live in our black joy. So now you know that this is not by chance that I am here speaking with confidence and clarity. It is because of them, black women, ancestors, elders, family and community. It is because of you, Dr. Lopez, Dr. Burford, Dr. Hampton, Dr. Butler, Dr. Wani. My goodness, it is because of all of you that I am here. And I hope I honor you and lift you up every day in all I do with love. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, I feel it necessary to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Deborah Peart. I am the Assistant Director, EDI Recruitment and Engagement at OISE. And I have to say that um, I'm truly honored uh, uh, that Dr. ABC invited me to actually be a part of this. Um, to become a black woman scholar, a woman scholar is something that I aspire to. And to be in this space, I want you to know this is something that conceptually I never fathomed. Being a young girl, growing up in Waterloo, being the only reflection or likeness of myself outside of my mother, not realizing that this was actually a possibility to me is overwhelming. And I just wanna go back to something that Dr. Daniel was talking about. She was talking about acknowledging each other. So I just wanna pass this on. I'd say about two months ago, I was on the subway and I looked outside of the window as I was about to get off at, at St. George Station. I looked outside of the window and there was a black woman who was looking at me on the platform. And as I exited the train, she looked at me and she said, you go get him, Queen. I was shocked. That's it. And she just was gone. So then what I decided to do was, I'm going to pass that forward. You go get him, Queen. Every time I see another black woman walking down the street, I don't care who she is, look her in the eye. You go get them, be vocal. You go get them, queen. That's how we bring each other up because I didn't know for the rest of the day, that's what I'd be thinking about. You go get them, queen. And we wear our crowns, we wear them high, we wear them with pride. I am honored to be in this space with these women who I intend to learn from as I move forward. Thank you to all of you. Hi everyone, so my name is Shernit Ald and I am a uh, doctoral student at OISE and, also, and I'm also an educator. And I'm here this evening just to say that to be successful at anything in life, I believe empathy and love needs to be at the forefront. And so today, I'm showing up to encourage all other Black women to be empathetic to each other and to spread love among each other. These, I believe, are two very important attributes to great leadership. I also want to encourage other Black women to always remember the less vulnerable in community and to extend a helping hand to them, if you are able to. Uh, despite all the achievements and all the accolades I've attained in life, the greatest joy I have experienced has come from projects that I've executed or worked on to extend a helping hand to the less vulnerable in community. And so there's this famous quote, we rise by lifting others up. And so I'm gonna to say to everyone, let's do it. Thank you.
Okay, hi everyone, good evening. I'm Dr. Cheryl Thompson. I'm at TMU in the School of Performance. And I'd, I'd actually like to just share a story um, because the storytelling is really my practice. I, I turned storytelling into my academic practice. So I went to McGill. I got a PhD at McGill. And I remember when I went to the convocation, my, my parents who come from Jamaica and my sister, we were the only black people in that audience of 800, okay? They sat them at the front. All the undergrads went through. There were 600 undergraduate students. Maybe I counted 25 black students. Then they did the MA students. Maybe I counted six, uh, 10 MA students. When it got to me, PhD, there was just me. And there was a hush that went through that crowd. And even though I'd been there five years, that was the first moment that I realized, oh, I'm a trailblazer. I had never seen myself as one, but I realized that that hush was two part. People were thinking, oh, isn't it great? McGill has a black person who got a PhD. And then the other side of the crowd was thinking, how did she do that? So to everyone out there who's thinking that you need to be some big name and all this to be a trailblazer, you're absolutely wrong. If you're the only one, if you walk in the room and everyone's like, hush, or if you walk in the room and people start staring at you, understand you're a trailblazer. And what that means is you don't have to wear that as a badge, like, oh, I guess I can't screw up. No, make mistakes. Being vulnerable is actually how you win in life, okay? So make your mistakes. It just means that when you blaze the trail, you have to ha have conscious awareness that you are blazing the trail and set an example for everyone who's come behind you. I went to McGill, I didn't have anyone. But since I'm at TMU, all I've been doing is building community because I don't want people to have to live through what I had to live through. So that's really my advice to all the Black women on this call. You're not alone, even if you feel like you're alone, but don't do what other people have done to you. Make it a point to blaze the trail because communities don't just happen, they get built. So thank you and have a good evening. So, wow, let me, you know, going last is, is always a challenge when you have to soak in everything, right? Um, but I just want to say, so my name is Deborah Buchanan Walford. I am an educator, but most importantly, I am Prudence and Linden's daughter. I'm Minil's granddaughter. I'm Henry's granddaughter. I'm David's mother. And I am a Black woman. And what I wanted to share with everyone was some lines of poetry from a poem that I have written based on the words of other Black female poets, and it's called It's Better to Speak. Truth-telling, honesty is the heartbeat of love, and there can be no love without justice, because the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. Because sometimes trauma is feeling that as a Black woman, you must be silent. No, no love, no peace. Trauma silences and buries our will to live because we were never meant to survive. But listen and remember who you are. Memories have tongue. You are the gifts our ancestors gave. You are their dream and their hope. You are the pride of the earth. You are not perfect and you don't need to be because flaws and all, you are enough. Thank you. Thank you. What I'm going to say is, well, we're going to welcome the panel. We're going to welcome other panel, Alana Butler, Professor Alana Butler, Professor Ann Lopez, Professor Linda Ifenu, Dr. Mary, Mary Green, Professor Shauna K. Tucker. And all I will say is, Professor or Dr. Natasha Buford, all I will say is, dear Black woman, I love you. Dear Black woman, I appreciate you. Dear Black woman, I thank you. Panel, over to you. I want to sit in all this tonight. Panel, it's over to you. Okay. Okay, I'm honored to be moderating the panel um, this evening. Um, it's beyond an honor. Um, some of you in this room have inspired me to join academia. Uh, in 2000, I'm going to be one minute because Dr. ABC said I need one minute. One minute. Okay, Dr. ABC, one minute. 
Um, in 2005, I took Dr. Wane's Black Feminist Thought, never thinking I would become a professor. I also remember seeing Dr. Ann Lopez. I did the Bachelor of Education program at OISE. Um, so I was inspired by these incredible Black women. And what I want to say before we uh, start our panel for my one minute is the importance of sisterhood and mentorship. Following on what uh, Dr. Uh, Beverly Jean Daniel said so powerfully, um, Dr. Beverly Jean Daniel has been one of my mentors. And one of the things I did when I entered academia was to be very intentional about fo forming a sister circle. It is so important. Many of you have touched on the idea of sisterhood and how important it is. But at all levels, we need our sisters. Um, this year, I applied for tenure. I can't tell you the support I received from my sister circle, like Dr. Robert e. R Roberta Timothy, for instance, um, Dr. Beverly Jean Daniel. I had many Black women who helped me put my tenure file together. So I just want to say how important it is at all levels to you, we need to mentor each other. And I plan to do the same for others as well to support them. So supporting each other is something we all need to do. And I'm very, very grateful to many of you in the room who served as a mentor to me to be the first black woman at Queen's University in the Faculty of Education. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the support and love from all of you. And I also wanna thank um, Dr. Um, ABC for putting this together so beautifully. I'm a huge fan of this. And this year is even better. I love the format, Dr. ABC. It's beautiful, beautifully well done. And you are a treasure for OISE, Dr. ABC. Now, we are going to introduce the panel members are going to speak on the theme. And the order that Dr. ABC gave me begins with Dr. Marie Green. So go ahead, Dr. Marie Green. Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. I hope that you can all hear me OK. Um, I am, I'm just, um, I'm still receiving everything that's been said tonight. And I love it when, you know, you go to jot down the words that you want to say, and then you hear those words and they act as confirmation. So I really want to just thank you for all the speakers before and the words that you've spoken and shared tonight. I also want to thank our Dr. Campbell for organizing this and also agree that I absolutely love the format. And to all the professors present here tonight, our Dean for making this space um, for this kind of um, gathering to happen. And I'm really also very incredibly humbled to be part of this amazing panel of gifted women that were here tonight. And I just want to take a moment to recognize and to invoke and to memorialize a few names. I know our Dr. Allen, um, spoke a few names tonight and I'm really grateful for that. And um, I also want to uh, to just call a, a few names in, in, in our space tonight as we gather. I wanna start with Boise TC, Georgia Wilson. A mother, student and educator in her own right. And I also wanna call the name of Bev Maskell business owner, community champion, and Bev Salmon, former councilwoman and community champion. And I also wanna give uh, a, a huge um, acknowledgement to Jean Augustine, who, you know, we, we gather every month to celebrate Black History Month. We, we obviously wanna do it more uh, throughout the year, but to know that it is a nationally recognized month um, it means a lot. And it's there because of this person who was willing to stand up and demand for it to happen. All of these women, champion education, showed up for me and directly touched my life in a very special way. And if we have time today, I'll tell you some of those stories. And last but not least, I want to thank my grandmother, Miss Gertie, a giant in my neighborhood, who taught me to read and write before I even started school. And to my mother, who I think may very well be on this call tonight, who is not only a woman of faith, but who took me to the gates of one of the most prestigious private schools in Clarendon, Jamaica, 
and insisted that I would be going there even though she did not have the money and could not afford it. And to this day, she's all about seeing her grandkids in school getting an education. So let me start with the good news. You've heard it all here tonight already. As this panel attests, we are brilliant. We have a lot to celebrate and we have a lot to be proud of. And there's so many wonderful and wonderful women in academia right here in Toronto and elsewhere just showing up and doing great work. And I wish that every Black History Month we could get, you know, get together and talk about the glorious past, golden kingdoms, our great antiquity, our contribution to civilizations, and all of those wonderful things. But here we are. And the afterlife of slavery is real. The fact remains that even in these spaces, these academic spaces that we have it, we often face trials and tribulations that are directly connected to our race. We know that there is nothing micro about the aggressions we face in the workplace and in our classrooms. Womb, W-O-M-B, apartheid is real. Because even when we leave the building with all the letters behind our names, we still have to hope and pray that we find a gynecologist who is not racist and that the people delivering our babies are okay with being more babies and black babies entering this world. Over the past um, few years and, and very recently, we've seen the attempted and what I can only describe as a very public lynching of academic figures from Nicole Hannah-Jones to Claude Gay. And here's the thing, a public lynching is this, was designed and is designed to do one thing. And this is the reason why oftentimes it wasn't in the backwards of the forest that these things were done. They were done after church service in the, on the same land linked to the church. That's right, I know it's hard for some of us to hear that, especially for some of us who are church going folks, but that's what happened. There are pictures to prove it. And the reason why it was done so publicly for everyone to see, and you know, it, it, people would pack picnic baskets and things like that. And the reason why that was done was because it, it, it was a way to send the message to the others, to say that if you step out of line, if you pass your place, if you try to come up any higher than where we put you, this is what will happen to you. But here we are, we overcame. We're still here and we are absolutely not going anywhere. So those are the known issues. We know that racism is an issue. But what I really want us to move towards is what we are going to do for ourselves and in our community to make sure that each of us can actually come out of these struggles and these trials and these spaces that don't always embrace us alive and well. And what I hope this generation of academics will do is to follow the examples laid out for us by the Gene Augustines of the world, the Beverly Nasco of the world, and the Bev Salmons of the world, and share the wisdom, tips, and tricks, pass on the tools that help to survive, overcome, and excel. I want us to meaningfully think about creating spaces where we can gather to be intentional about celebrating each other and sharing resources. I love it that someone has spoken to this and a number of people have spoken to this already, but the days of passing each other in the hall without greetings are over. Lowering and averting our eyes just won't do. Acknowledging a black brother or sister in the space will not make you any blacker than you already are. They already know you're black. We need to get to that place where we are unapologetically showing up to claim not just the place at the table, that as our Dr. Day alludes to, that if it becomes necessary, that we create our own tables, if that's what we need for that moment in time. I want to see us moving from funds of knowledge to real funds, from journaling to our own Black journals. I want us as a Black community to get to a space where we are drawing on the wealth, the sheer wealth of our community, because we know it's there, so that when we get into conversations with the rest of the community, the wider community, we are dictating the terms of how our needs will be met and not with someone else setting the terms 
as is often the case. Thank you. Wow. Dr. Marie Green, that was phenomenal. I'm. We should give 10 seconds before we go to the next speaker because you had so much in there that was so powerful. I just want people to think about what you just said. 10 seconds. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marie Green. Okay, our next presenter I'm gonna introduce is equally phenomenal, Dr. Linda Awenofu. Dr. Linda Awenofu, and welcome. Hello, hello, welcome everybody. Um, it's such an honor. I, mean, I just feel privileged, humbled, you know, um, as Dr. Green said, I'm soaking it all in. I, I feel completely nourished um, right now. And it, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm taking notes. I'm like, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, but thank you so much. What an honor to be in this space with everybody tonight. Um, I, you know, just amazing. I am also an assistant professor here at OEZ, and I, I really wanted to talk, you know, a, and bring attention to what it means to be a Black woman in, um, you know, in psychology and, and mental health education leaderships. I know that there might be, you know, current or aspiring students who, um, or people who are interested in life sciences, you know, who are watching and waiting in the wings. And um, I want to give voice and bring attention to some of the the some of those issues in this field uh, specifically, which in many ways are mirror all of our experiences collectively as Black women in these spaces. Um, you know, but I really love that we're centering Black women leadership today um, because it's just something that you don't see a lot in the field of, of psychology. Um, you know, I, to give some context as a psychologist, I'm, you know, you work in a field that in mental health in general that was intentionally designed to destroy um, people who look like us, right? Um, just my existence as a practitioner, let alone any form of leadership in this field is an antithesis to the origins and intentions of the field for black folks, right? Because we weren't meant to be included as practitioners or leaders. Um, there's a really ugly history there, you know, where, Black folks were used as experimental tools, right? To be discarded. We were not seen as human, less than unintelligent, you know, undeserving of basic dignities. Obviously that's a reflection of, of our, our, the context of oppression and colonization, right? But what it's meant is that there's been a real lack of diversity in this field, like many others, um, you know, and especially those who are trained from a clinical psychology standpoint. And we need more of our folks to serve our communities. I am so excited now, you know, compared to when I started to see many wonderful, wonderful, you know, black um, practitioners, black women, especially in the field. You know, I really admire the field of social work or, you know, a, a, an allied profession to ours where there's fantastic black women. There's so many, um, you know, to name and that are really blazing a trail in their own right. And it, it's very, very inspiring. But there, we need so much more. I encourage people to read this paper um, by Dr. Sonia Faber, Dr. Monica Williams and, and their team, uh, most of them at U University of Ottawa. It's called Lions at the Gate, How Weaponization of Policy Prevents People of Color from Becoming Professional Psychologists in Canada. And they talk about you know, the mental health crisis that we have um, and, and the shortage of, shortage of diversified professionals in our field at where the doors right um, to this profession are closed pretty early on um, to block us from coming in to, to, to sort of sustain the power, who holds power um, um, reflecting certain kinds of people, right? So we know that, especially in the professional psychology field, when we talk about you know, who holds the most power, it's people who have um, you know, degrees like in clinical or counseling um, or school psychology. Right. So there's all these sort of hierarchies within the profession that um, where their doors close to certain people um, more than others. And it needs to stop. You know, it, it, our communities need our help. They need the benefit of all of the talented professionals that are out there. 
So there, there is no need for these for these uh, doors to be closed or these barriers. Um, that makes it very, very lonely. You know, so what the implication for somebody like myself, if we're thinking about leadership in this area, is that often, like many of us, you're the first, right? Or the only or the one of the few in many spaces. Um, and it, the, there's so much loneliness and isolation that can come from that. And I'm so grateful that there is a growing community in other, in other sort of environments and, you know, even within the institution I'm in, being part of the Black Faculty Caucus and having access to other wonderful, wonderful Black scholars who are there, who support and hold up. Like just knowing that they are there um, means so much, right? Uh, but it, but it really is an issue that that we have to start working to, to open those doors. And that's why I really appreciate a lot of the comments that have been shared so far tonight in terms of kind of holding that door open, you know, creating those um, pathways for people to come through. Uh, and that is something that I'm very, very passionate about. I don't think I would be here, you know, um, in this role as faculty. There's there's many opportunities to, you know, in, do lucrative work in private practice and all that, um, that you kind of sacrifice to be somebody who is contributing to blazing a trail um, and to, to being a model for what it can look like to have you know, black faces uh, in in a leadership role in a psychology, a field that is so heavily westernized, right? I mean, uh, even within our community, there's a lot of mistrust um, in in this field, right? Just because of what it looks like. Uh, and my training even was not decolonized, so it's very hard. I think one of the the challenges I want to really highlight: it's hard to kind of form and, and create a research program that's focused on decolonizing psychology, which I'm very passionate about, but in a context where I have colleagues who think that that represents some sort of undermining of the field, right? Like they're fearful of the idea of decolonization. Um, so we have in this area a long way to go, uh, but I'm very, very inspired. I see many, many people coming up and um, I just really wanted to give voice to this to this particular you know discipline and how much um, how much has been done, but how much we need to do, and how important it is for many of us who have broken through. You know the the Roberta Timothy's, as someone mentioned today. Um, you know Monica Williams at, at Ottawa. There's so there's so many. You know I can't even think of them now, but that are doing the work. You know that are modeling what it looks like to engage in this, to hold that that door open for those who are coming up. So, you know, let's let's keep up the work. And I, I'm so grateful, ever grateful to have community and to be able to find and create that sister circle that many of you have talked about, um, not just within that discipline, but know that there's so many of us in different spaces that can hold each other up and, and be a support system. So thank you very much. And I can't wait to, to get more into this conversation. Wow. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Iwanofu. You made some really important comments, and I'm glad that you're speaking about psychology, because uh, just last week, there was a, the, in, in my university, there is a Black doctoral student in psychology, and she said to me, I'm so tired of being the only one. You know, so what you speak about is so important because in psychology, as we know, it's very, very, they, you know, they're very few. We mentioned, we we know and love Dr. Roberta Timothy, who's done work in this area for a long time, but I'm so happy that you're here and you're speaking and you're going to be a mentor. So I'm looking forward to actually connecting you with this, this psychology student because she'll be overjoyed uh, just to know that you're there. Um, so thank you so much for speaking about psychology because it's so important. Um, to, to, to raise that issue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go on to the next speaker now. Um, our next, we're gonna invite Dr. Shauna K. Tucker to speak. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Butler. And thank you everyone for joining us today. It's such a privilege and an honor to be speaking and learning from all of you. I definitely concur with what everyone has said that so many of the things that have been shared feel like a lot of confirmation of the things that we all experience. Um, and so I won't go too much into all those things, but I definitely resonate with a lot of what has been said, 
I think particularly some of the things that Dr. I don't know if you just shared, I resonate with that being in a similar field, but probably I'll tell you a bit more about myself and what I do to give some context. So I'm Shauna and I am, I think in the lineup, probably the newer or the newest faculty member um, in at OEZ or specifically in CTL, so curriculum teaching and learning. And so my research is in the language and literacies program. And so what I do is that I study language and literacy development among children, largely, mostly in the global South and particularly in the Caribbean. And so I study a lot of Creole languages, which has direct um, relation to how I grew up and my own personal history. I grew up in Jamaica, I was born and raised in Jamaica. And I moved to Canada as an international student. So I studied at UTSC, where I did psycholinguistics, so a mix of psychology and linguistics before going to the UK as an international student quite a few years later to do um, my master's and my PhD. So that's kind of the background that has influenced my interest in um, Creole languages and language acquisition. Like Dr. Linda, um, applied linguistics is a field that there is so little representation of Black scholars um, in the field, and that results in our languages not being represented. And so there is a strong emphasis on learning French and the different European languages and English, of course, um, but very little attention has been paid to West African Pidgin English, Creole spoken in the Caribbean, or languages in other contexts in the Global South. And so a lot of my work is doing that, working with immigrant communities in Toronto, for example, to see what do Jamaicans really think about how their language is used in the diaspora? What are their views about who owns the language, how the language is used, or how do children develop um, literacy within the Caribbean, or what are the diff what are the specific family literacy practices that people in the Caribbean or the global South might employ that look quite different from what the models that we create from Western perspectives look like? That might look like going to Sunday school rather than it being a focus on storybook reading, as we tend to use to measure these things and end up looking at the global South or the Caribbean or African countries from more of a deficit perspective. So a lot of my work is in highlighting that and exposing my students who are largely going to go into the field of language teaching or research to these other areas of research, these other underrepresented or what we call lesser studied languages. So a big theme for me when I think of the topic at hand today is representation and what what links that has with showing up. And for me, existing in the space, I think, in applied linguistics in this field is showing up. Across the years I've taught at OEZ or at the University of Oxford, I have always either been the only Black student, as many of you have shared in any study of language acquisition, second language studies. And I see that in the students who sit in front of me that I think I've had one black student across the courses that I've taught. And so for me, showing up is really being in this space and persisting and giving empathy to the students and also exposing them to this other side of what exists beyond English and French. So that's a big part of my work in is representation. I think for me to tell a small story, I worked at the University of Toronto Scarborough before even considering being an academic. And I was supporting a community development program, um, an event for black students in the Scarborough area. And I was just supporting the event administratively. And I sat in on a lecture. We were allowing the students to listen to a lecture given by a black professor. And it was actually one of the most significant moments in my own history where I didn't realize that for the first time I had never seen or listened to a black professor. 
And this was probably six years ago, so not that long ago, but it was the first time that I was hearing a black professor speak and he was so passionate, so excited that that was a huge turning point that for the first time I thought, oh, this is something I could actually do. I love teaching, but I could actually teach at this level and I could be passionate about what I'm doing. And so that has been probably the biggest thing for me that even if it means making mistakes, but just showing up and letting students know that there is room for you and trying to make room for students to have space in a field that there are, I don't know any other black professors in person that is. I know a lot of American scholars who have read about, but within this space, um, which poses the challenge um, for me or as similar scholars that Yes, room has been made. I think lots of advances have been made. And a lot of that has to do with your work. Many of the people in this room, the fact that I was even hired as a young Black professor, I think that is standing on the shoulders of giants here who fought for these positions to be made. I know a lot of work has gone into that. And I think it's continuing to rally for more room because now that we're here, it is the job of, to make community, but also for me to find mentors. Now that I'm here to find mentors in my field, I might have to go, I don't know, to, to the US because there are very few. So I think that's the one challenge that I continue to grapple with. Now that I'm here, how do I make community within my field? How do I learn from people within my field who also look like me? Um, and how do I not, allow myself to be burnt out, being the one, being the sole Black person within my unit, doing this type of work, and thus being called upon a lot more than other people to do things outside of the requirements of tenure. And so those are some of the things that I've been grappling with and that come to mind um, in terms of showing up in this space. I'll hand over to the next person. Thank you so much, Dr. Tucker. You had a lot of things to say that really touched on a lot of uh, the th the comments made by uh, Dr. Winofu before. You are both trailblazers, um, psycholinguistics, as you said, Dr. Tucker, always being the only one. And your theme about representation is so important. And I think it's exciting to hear that you you know, both of you are really trailblazers in your field. And hopefully, you know, in another five years, 10 years, there's going to be more students who will be like, well, I was a student of Dr. Tucker, and that's what we want. So this panel was so well put together. Well done again, Dr. ABC. You have two future trailblazers here uh, in, the, in the field. Wow. Um, can we take any more? Yes, Dr. ABC, we can. Wow, this is just too much. Um, Dr. Natasha Buford. Very excited to hear about you, but thank you again, Dr. Tucker, for your amazing words. Dr. Buford. Buford. You. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Um, so uh, good evening. Welcome, everyone. I want to, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, I want to thank first Dr. ABC, uh, Dr. Campbell, for inviting me to speak this evening. Uh, I want to thank all of the women that I share the panel and the stage with today. Um, but mostly the, the women that have mentored me, many of whom are on this call tonight. Um, I thank you um, for mentoring me in terms of my academic journey. Um, I also want to thank actually the students. I want to thank the Black female students who I have a pleasure of actually teaching at, at OISE in the MT department um, of CTL. Um, the ones that actually see me in the space, because like many of the women before me spoke, it is very isolating. It can be very lonely. And a lot of times I see and I have young Black women and men coming up to me just to say thank you, uh, to, you know, thank you for representing. Uh, thank you for being um, someone that they can talk to. And, you know, I don't think that I, I say, I'll speak for myself. You know, I don't say it enough to just to say thank you for validating us and when you are in spaces where sometimes you're challenged, and I know we're going to get more into that, uh, when you have just, you know, not only are we, um, you know, the first 
the only or the different, but we have spaces, um, especially institutions like University of Toronto, like OISE, where you know the there is maybe only one uh, student in the class that is black. Um, you know, to have them come up to you and to appreciate and to validate uh, the teaching that you do is important. And I think that you know I want to acknowledge and recognize uh, those students who I truly, truly, truly appreciate. Um, so I want to say thank you to them. Um, uh, I, I lecture uh, in the Masters of Teaching Department at CTL. I've been doing that since 2020, uh, but I also teach in the Toronto District School Board. So I've been teaching for the last 17 years uh, in the Toronto District School Board at the elementary level, and I've been in the union for four years. So that is sort of my experience into, into academia. Um, and met, for those who uh, have been in my classrooms, uh, I do share my story um, because I'm coming from that education lens um, where, you know, I'm a product of C.W. Jeffries, come from Jane and Finch, uh, went to York University uh, for Teachers College, and then came to OISE for my master's and my PhD. And it was professors like Joki Wan, Dr. Wan, and professors like um, George Day, who said, Natasha, you deserve to be here, that there's a space for you here. And it wasn't until taking classes, like many of uh, many of you earlier said, having mentors and taking classes for people from people who look like us, where I finally had my moment. I had my 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 um my moment where I was able to see what education had 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 really did to me. I was able to wake up and I was able to read scholars, um, you know, like Frantz Fanon, and understanding that I had been colonized and that the education system was one of trauma. And I didn't realize that growing up. And so that was a huge uh, point in my life where I decided that OISE was where I wanted to be and that I continued learning at OISE. And then eventually, like I said, uh, uh, Dr. Wong was my supervisor and I um, got my PhD in 2020 and started teaching. And so this evening, I want to come from not just that place of decolonization, but a, a place of faith, because that has been so huge in my life. Last year, when we talk about balance for Black women and health, like my the previous two speakers spoke about, uh, last year, I got really sick. And um, I realized that I was just doing way too much. I have three children. And I was balancing both work and family and trying to be everything to everyone. And um, I reached my pinnacle and I was hospitalized. And uh, one of the social workers in the hospital, because in the hospital, believe it or not, I was still working. I was still teaching. I was teaching online, teaching my empty classes online. And the social workers thought, you know what, there's something wrong with you, with her. They, they called a social worker and I received a book. Uh, it was called When the Body Says No. Uh, and it's um, The Cost of Hidden Stress by Dr. Gaber Mate. And um, that was a huge, also a huge turning point for me where I had to put myself first. And uh, even before my children, even before my husband, I said, if I need, if I want to survive, it needs to be about me. And that has been um, such a transitional point in my life where I am, I've always been a woman of faith, but it was putting all of that into action and understanding as Black women, there's so many times that we, uh, you know, take on so much. We try to be the hero, uh, the superwoman. We all know of the stereotypes when it comes to Black women, you know, strong Black women. And I just realized I need to be vulnerable. It's okay for me to rest. Uh, you know, rest is 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 resilience. It's 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 what we need to uh, prioritize in our lives. And so when we talk about mental health, I also want to just talk about you know uh, physical health as well and the rest that we need as Black women uh, on these academic journeys because there's so many times that you know we're going to be just tired mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and so those are the things that I just want to prioritize in these conversations as well is just the rest. Because if we are not good for ourselves, and I know that sounds cliche, but if we're not good for ourselves, we cannot be good for anybody else. 
And so I'm so excited and honored to be on this panel with all of you. And I look forward to the deeper conversation. Thank you. Yes, yes, you've really given us some good points. I think, you know, as Black women, we can be guilty of that. Like, I, I can totally relate to you being a sessional, like wanting to work and you keep working and you're sick. You know, we, we do, we work ourselves to to sickness in many cases. Um, So I think you raised such important points about taking care of yourself. And if you can't do that, then how do we take care of others? And I think that's a very um key to the theme we're talking about today, because we know as Black women, we often take on too much. We do this all the time and we're asked to do too much and we take on too much. So thank you, thank you for those those wonderful words. You can see in the chat there, the effect you're having. Um, wow, I'm honored, honored to introduce Dr. Anne Lopez. Now, Dr. Lopez, you will not remember, but I was once, I did my Bachelor of Education and you came out to the audience and you were the at then academic director of the initial teacher education program. And I looked and I was like, wow, look at this wonderful black woman. I was just blown away. Anyway, I just wanna say it's wonderful to see how I get to introduce you now. This is just amazing. Anyway, I get to introduce, um, I've always been a fan, so a fan for over 20 years, Dr. N. Lopez. <laughs> wow, thank you so much, Dr. Butler. And first of all, um, before I thank everybody, let's just clap ourselves. We are in space showing up for each other. That's what it's about. So let's clap ourselves and, and really draw on that joy. We are not here sitting in trauma today. We're not sitting in pain. We're not sitting in any of that. We're truly here to celebrate, to be joyful, to be joyous. And really, um, so, so much as what has gone on before and talked about is that Black knowledge. It's the richness, as Andrew likes to say, Dr. Campbell likes to say, he's just full already. And, you know, I just full already, and I'm full already. Before I give my few um, comments, I just want to thank Dr. ABC for taking this baton and just going with that from where we started. And he insisting that we need to do this, we need to carry it on, and, and can't thank you enough, Dr. ABC. And, and I, too, just love the format. Just having others in space who I'm not normally in space with is just so amazing. And I think, uh, you know, it's I also want to thank Professor Wan for reminding us, as she always does, of all the queens, of all our ancestors, of all the shoulders, that there were actually great Black women. And to that list, I want to add Nanny of the Maroons from Jamaica, who really, along with Kojo, fought the colonizers. And I actually had the opportunity of going to a compound in January to the celebration of the Maroons who fought the British. Now, there's some contested history between the Maroons and the British. We won't um, sort of um, focus on that. But, but, they, but our African ancestry and our heritage that we continue to bring with us and that continue to inform our lives. The other hero and queen I want to bring in this space and whomever talked about their grandmother, anybody who knows me, know that I've always talked about my grandmother as my guiding light, as that woman who taught me that I should love myself and that taught me that Black is beautiful and who taught me to really have that confidence. So, of course, we all have our, our queens and heroes who, uh, who, we, who have always supported us. But for me today, what is so special about this moment, and I really want to focus on it's, it's the showing up for Black women, because I think that is so important. And what do we mean by showing up? And how do we show up? And when do we show up? I think it's such an important conversation to have. So building on all of uh, my colleagues um, who have gone on before and, and sort of shared their stories and shared their own lived experiences around their joys, their tribulations, and those who have supported them. So I kind of just want to focus a little bit on the why, why we must show up. Now, onto Dr. Burford's idea, showing up doesn't mean we show up to the point of exhaustion. That's not the kind of showing up that we're, we're talking about here. We're talking about sustained showing up. I also want to draw on what Dr. Daniels talked about. How do we sort of limit the barriers 
that that prevent us from from being in space for each other. So in 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 sort of thinking through what it means to show up, I think we have to sort of and we'll have different entry points to this, but we have to recognize that black women have been devalued and been disrespected, particularly in academia. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that, that sometimes we are called in to do the work. When I say the work, I do not mean the critical work. I mean the labor, to give both the physical labor and the emotional labor. And I have been there in, in my role as academic director and in my, all of my other roles in higher education where we could actually use a little bit more help. And where oftentimes our knowledge is sometimes taken and you only see your knowledge when it's someplace else. And, you know, um, I will not get into all of that, but if any of you was watching what is happening today on the television with Fanny Willis, where we talked about how Black women are being devalued and disrespected. So why then do we show up? We show up as an act of support. I remember when I was being hired at OISE and going for that talk, I didn't know Professor Wan very well then, but she showed up. She was up front in space looking at me and so was um, Dr. Lance McGreedy and so on and so forth. The point I'm trying to make here is that sometimes we do not need to be asked to show up. We should just show up. In spaces, I think as Dr. Daniels talked about giving that nod, just giving that look, just and then we're gone. And so showing up looks like different things and it means different things. Now I have a tendency to tend to show up and I think Dr. Burford talked about her students. We also have to show up for our students. We have to show up for our black students in higher ed. And, you know, and we really need to be intentional around that. I think it was Dr. Green who says, don't worry, um, they already know we're Black. That is amazing. But Dr. Green may add to that and say, do we know that we are Black? Because some of us are Black, but do not hold on or embrace that Blackness. So what does that mean in terms of us showing up? So we have to show up to mitigate the way in which Black women tend to be devalued, tend to be disrespected. And we need to show up for that community. We also need to show up not to be in trauma and pain, but we need to show up to participate in the joy. And I think it's Dr. ABC who always likes to remind us of that Black joy. And I really can't say enough of how important that is. The other thing I want to say quickly about that is we are not showing up to be representation only. Representation without power is useless. We need to show up and people know that when we show up, we're not there just to be in smiles. We are there to change that space. We are there to make that space better. We're not showing up as somebody's checkbox. And may I say that again, we are not showing up so that white supremacy can feel that they have a checkbox. We are showing up to change the status quo. We're showing up to share policies. We're showing up in support. So those are some of the reasons why we show up. The other thing I want to go to quickly, why we must show up, that spiritual, that emotional support is necessary for, for resistance. It is that, 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 that feeling that we have community, that we have critical friends is so such an important part of resistance. It's also an important part of that joy. And I think showing up is a way of talking back to white supremacy. It's a way of saying we are here. It's a way of saying we are here. We talk back to white supremacy with our bodies. We talk back to white supremacy with our bodies. And when we go into spaces, when we show up, when we come as a community, yes, we're saying to white supremacists, we are here and we are not going to play, we participate in our own marginalization. So I think, and, and the reason I'm sharing this is then the takeaways. What are we going to walk away with from this webinar today? And if there's nothing else, my sisters and my brothers who are here with us, is to ask ourselves, how am I going to show up tomorrow? Can I be a little bit better? I know I can be a little bit better. I know there's more for me to do in showing up. And the last piece I'm going to say, showing up for Black women in higher education I think we have some work to do in terms of how we think about our scholarly collaborations. Who are we collaborating? Oh, oh, my internet is gone. 
Uh oh, is this kicked out? Oh dear. We can still hear you. We can still, you can still hear me. Oh, something happened. I have no idea what happened there. My whole screen just vanished in front of me. I thought, I thought my internet had gone. Okay. My, my, uh, my, my, it's snowing outside. It's very bad. Okay. All right. So the last thing I wanted to quickly say, um, not to go over my five minutes, is that we have to show up in terms of the practicality of in other ways as well, show up in having those scholarly works, collaborate with each other, be intentional. If we are having something, we invite other scholars in. And because really and truly, many of us who are now uh, well-established in academia and higher ed needed somebody to say, here's something that you can do to have a first publication. Here's a conference you can go to. Here is some, so these are, so besides the emotional and spiritual support, besides all of that community, there's some practical things that we can do, particularly in higher ed. This other thing that we also have to ask ourselves, how are we supporting our black students to be the future leaders? So again, I just want to end by saying that we show up in different ways. I also want to build on what Dr. Burford says, that we show up as best as we're able to. We do not have to take ourselves to the point of exhaustion, but we have to be intentional. So we leave here with all of this joy tonight. And I'm telling you, my cup, my plate, my pot, everything I have is overflowing, just being in space and all those who are online with us. And just the power of Blackness. And, and just just really embracing the spirit of our ancestors who I know are dancing at seeing all of us here. So I just want to say, I'm just so happy to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. What a blessing you've conferred on us with your words, um, a true blessing. Um, you really talked about showing up, the different ways that we show up and talking back to white supremacy that was something I had to write down. I'm taking notes. I'm going to have to watch this again. But you, real gems in there. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think many of us will have to watch this video again because there's so many things in there, so many things. And I like the way you connected to Dr. Burford's comment and build on them. That was really, really great. Okay, now, Dr. ABC, in his brilliant structuring of this event, has a round two. So for round two, each person was asked, each of our panelists was actually asked to create their own question. Okay, so this will be another exciting part of this. So as Dr. ABC always says, wait for it. So our first one will be, the first speaker we're gonna have is Dr. Marie Green again. Dr. Marie Green, your question was, how do we create spaces that center Black joy, aspirations, and accomplishment while holding the Academy accountable for tangible change and honoring commitments to anti-racism measures? I'll write, I'll put it in the chat, but over to you, Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Um, funny, because when I wrote that question, I didn't imagine myself answering it, to be honest with you. <laughs> But I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a shot at it. Well, you know, um, as I was listening to the question, a story um, came to mind, and I was reminded of one of an, um, one of the individuals that I mentioned earlier at the start of the talk, um, Bev Stammen, who was a uh, city councilor and uh, um, uh, recently passed, uh, was also a, a community activist and very big on education, and definitely championing women's education. And uh, I was in my early 20s. I had gone to her parish, which is at York Mills, um, uh, York, which is the kind of like a church on top of the hill there, right at York Mills and Young. And I'd gone there with my choir to perform. And as we were coming out of the sanctuary uh, at the end of the, the uh, mass, uh, she was standing at the door and she was greeting all the young people as they went by. And as I went by, I, I stopped to, to introduce myself to her, talk to her because I knew I knew who she was. And um, she reached out and she held my hands. And of course, when I took my hand away, it had a $5 bill in it. Um, she might as well have given me a million dollars because what that $5 said was, I see you, um, I am here for you and I've got you. And it meant everything to me to get that level of affirmation from an elder in the community, from a stalwart in the community, 
So when I think about how we create spaces that center Black joy, I think about how we do that on an individual level, but also on a collective level, like literally just celebrating each other in the way that so many of our speakers have talked about tonight, finding ways to just reach out and to say to someone, I've got you. Um, I think about how so many times where I coming through my coming through my uh, my studies where someone reached out and did that for me. And there, there are no words to describe what it means when someone says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this thing for you. Or I'm going to give you this gift or I'm going to um, uh, help you out in this case just because they believe and also because someone else did that for them and they're passing it on. And many of us in this space tonight uh, know that there are a number of um, uh, uh, professors here at the university and, and Dr. Lopez talk, spoke to this, but Dr. Day and, 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 and Dr. Wayne also um, are individuals who over the years have been responsible for giving individuals their first publications, which we all know it's super important to have that. And when I think about the the time and energy that goes into that and holding space for individuals that are coming up, it's super important that we have those tangibles, that we're doing something that we can actually put our hands on that's making a significant difference in the lives of our uh, upcoming students, our upcoming um, academics and our upcoming scholars. I also want to talk about how, you know, when we do that and we find ways to to celebrate each other, even if it's just a monthly wine and cheese, or uh, getting together in a in a in a um, in a space, or in someone's home, that we also find space to be able to hold the uh, the the academic um, uh, our academic leadership, you know, hold them accountable for some of the things that are sometimes promised but never delivered. So right now, for example, we have uh, we had a task an anti racism task force. There were a number of um, uh, uh, recommendations that were made. A couple of the folks on the panel uh, in our space tonight were involved in that process. We're still not at those numbers where we should be in terms of representation. That's something that we need to continually hold our um, our leadership, our, our, our university leadership to. And the other thing that I want to point out is that, you know, when we talk about that accountability, as we come into the space of academics, we always have to kind of decide which route we're going to take. And there are many avenues that we could take. We could be the, 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 the quiet academic, we just, you know, head down and we just do our great work and we uh, make our wonderful academic contributions and we can slowly rise through the ranks and that sort of thing and get to a place where we can actually, will be, have, you know, in a, pl a position to make tangible decisions. Or we can be trailblazers who, the minute you get in the door and we have uh, an opportunity to do something and make a change that we do it. And right here in our, um, in our, in our space tonight, we have individuals who have done that. A lot of the programs, especially our Black affinity programs that we have here at OAZ in our NT program are there because of individuals like Dr. Campbell, um, like uh, Dr. Montemuro who stood up and said, you know, let's, let's do this. Let's do something that makes the difference. So it's really important as we come into these spaces to kind of decide what route we're going to take, but to be bold and to be unapologetic in standing up and putting forward ideas that we know will make a difference in our community and in our academic spaces for Black students, for Black scholars that are coming out. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marie Green. There was so much there. Um, I know Dr. ABC, a lot of people are taking notes. Um, wonderful pieces that you had in there, so many things. And it was nice how you also connected to your early statements as well. Um, very, very well done. Um, thank you again for your words about unapologetic. I love that. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question that we have uh, came from Dr. Linda Iwinofu, and I put this in the chat so everybody can see the question as I read it. 
As a mental health practitioner, can you share some early warning signs that a Black woman in a leadership role might be at risk of or maybe struggling with mental health difficulties? Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I guess I felt, you know, that it was imperative being someone who's been trained in, in mental health and, and, and to speak to this issue of sort of being attentive to noticing when things aren't going so well. You know, the resignation of Dr. Claudine Gay, the loss of Dr. Antoinette Kenya Bailey were public reminders for us that, you know, this type of work can take a toll. As much as we wanna focus on our joy and our resistance, there is a reality that it can be hard to cope with the stereotypes, you know, that we are strong, that there's little room for error, that we have to be role models, even when we don't, may not have the energy to do it, um, you know? And so as people have mentioned here so far, yes, yeah, sometimes showing up can mean doing so to a point of exhaustion, you know? Um, and in some cases that means stepping away from the work altogether, or in the worst of cases, it can cost us lives. So we need to be able to identify when, you know, people are showing signs that they're struggling with this work. Um, and, you know, so, because it is a reality that some of our black leaders do experience anxiety, depression, you know, hopelessness, loneliness, um, post-traumatic stress sim symptoms and things like that. So how does that actually look? You know, I think a lot of people, and I, I appreciate Dr. Burford's um, vulnerability in sharing her experience um, because, it is so important, right, to, to kind of be attentive to ourselves. And I, I would start by saying, notice the signs in your body, you, you know, like your own inner wisdom and intuition will tell you that this is getting to be too much. Um, you know, your body really will keep a, a record of what's going on psychologically. Uh, but many people do signal their unhappiness, you know, in, in many ways, like making statements that they're overwhelmed or they're tired of the work or they feel like giving up. We have to be attentive to when our colleagues start to talk like that and share that. Um, but it might be things like feeling irritable, you know, uh, feeling sad all the time, not feeling like there's really much that makes you happy. When you notice that there's changes in a person's sleeping and eating patterns, and maybe their memory is not as good anymore, they can't focus on the work. Um, perhaps you have chronic health issues that are becoming worse, right? Um, and as I said, the body is a really important um, metric. You know, if you start to see a lot of physical symptoms, stomach problems, headaches, you know, um, it really important to start paying attention to those things and, and to start to, to seek uh, support, right? Um, so it's, I think it's really critical. Like these are some of the main ones that, you know, we want to be really attentive to. Um, also mentioning, you know, sometimes our colleagues might start to have a lot of worries and fears and panic attacks and um, might use negative coping, like, you know, prescription meds excessively and things. These things do happen, right? So we don't want it to get to that point. And it is normal that the work can become overwhelming. It's not that it's like it's, it doesn't happen, right? Uh, but we have to be attentive to when it gets to the point where we can, we're not really functioning at capacity anymore, right? when uh, we don't want to get to a state where we are hospitalized and you know it's it's very so it's very important to notice it in yourself take care of yourself and i know some of us um uh, my fellow panelists might talk about what we can do to combat this but you know it it it, it really is an important thing to be attentive and tune in tune into your body tune into your intuition it will tell you um and and, and start to take action in the ways that you can to combat that. I'll keep it short, <laughs> given our time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for those important words, um, Dr. Arwinoflu, that it's so important for us to pay attention to those things. So thank you. Just in the interest of time, I'm going to move along. Thank you once again. I'm moving on to Dr. Shauna K. Tucker. The question that um, Dr. Tucker will address is, in light of the challenges that have been discussed, what are some practices that you adopt or would suggest to others that might serve to guard your mental health, foster joy, and facilitate thriving in academia as a female faculty member? Thank you. And just quickly saying thank you, Dr. Linda. Those were really eye-opening, those warning signs that you shared. Um, so just off the back of that, I think for me, things that I've learned from more senior faculty or that I've had to figure out, I think the biggest one for me is staying hopeful. Um, staying hopeful and looking at the wins in the community, really focusing on the positive things also, as opposed to really 
situating ourselves in trauma and that type of discussion constantly. So I think being hopeful and looking to the future of what we can make together and what will come of this, um, I think that's a big one. And I think many people have spoken to the importance of community. And so I won't harp on that too long, but the importance of situating yourself in community, both for me, I found academic, but also wider than that, to almost remind me that life is bigger than this, that I'm more than an academic and just grounding myself for me in something bigger, which has been for me, my faith in something that grounds my life beyond um, how much I publish or don't publish or whether I get the grant or not. Um, so I think, and also having people in these spaces to share with um, and seeking out mentors. I think really practically though, one of the things I've learned is um, when I told my community that, oh, I got this job as um, a tenure track professor. One of the first things the head of a department um, back in Oxford said to me was, you cannot be on every committee because you're black if you're trying to make tenure. And that was a really practical step for me in knowing when I have to say no and not to carry this guilt, but know when I'm at the end or at my limit and when I just have to say no and step away from it and trust that everything will be okay, even though I have said no. Um, so that's another thing, say no. And I think finally, relatedly as well, is information filtering. For me, which might not be the approach for everyone, but I don't think we were made to take in so much bad news constantly in this information flood that we tend to get in this time in history. And so for me, that means sometimes monitoring how much bad news I read per day, how much sometimes taking breaks from that and trying to focus on some more positive things, um, celebrating the wins of other people as opposed to really taking in um, all the news of the day, which often these days is quite negative. So I think those are the key things that I have found help to foster joy and thrive in, in this field. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tucker. You have, you made some important points that I think so many of us can resonate with. I have to say, having submitted my tenure file to, so, you know, the reviewers came up over and over again, like, wow, Look at the amount of service that you that I have because I'm the only black professor compared to so many other people. Like I, I'm literally doing four or five times the amount of service. So I think what you say is so important for us to pay attention to, um, to look at um how to protect ourselves and at the same time, you know, we're 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 trying to progress and and also support each other. So thank you so much, Dr. Tucker, for your words. Now, next up will be Dr. Burford. And Dr. Burford, the question that we have for you is we're going to ask you, um, what advice do you have for Black doctoral students in primarily white institutions who are trying to, seeking to build community with other Black scholars and researchers? Thank you in advance, Dr. Burford. Thank you. Um, great question. So uh, advice that I'd have for Black doctoral students or even people who want to pursue their doctorate, because I tend to also take on a lot of um, teacher candidates, uh, also just in, even in my own classroom, is to make sure there's so many wonderful communities maybe that aren't advertised uh, as much in uh, at OISE. Uh, so one of the first things that I did as a Black doctoral student was to join um, the the research uh, groups. So I, I know that Dr. Juan has a, a group uh, on Fridays um, that I joined as well, that I'm still a part of on every, I think it's every first Friday of the month or every last Friday. Not sure, Dr. Juan, if you can clarify that. Um, and then I know that Dr. Day also has one. Um, so most professors um, have uh, like an actual uh, community group that uh, students can join. And that's a phenomenal place to not only meet other Black scholars or, you know, or people that are aligned with your work, but it also gives you opportunity to, um, you know, share your work. So share your, either your comps uh, or your, you know, as you're working on your dissertation, those are spaces that you're able to share your work and get amazing feedback with your work. So that would that probably would be the, the number one. 
but also just aligning yourself with, like we said, a lot of professors uh, here shared, uh, aligning yourself with the professors that can support you in the work that you do. So for my um, district, first Friday of the month, thank you. First Friday of the month, Dr. Day's meeting is last Friday of the month. Thank you, Dr. Wan. So, um, but also aligning your work with professors um, that share in your research, obviously not just the one that's supervising you, but a community of professors that can help you uh, as you um, are going along with your research and trying to either like, you know, find um, maybe uh, research um, when you're going to, again, do your comps or just uh, go through your ethics. That was a really hard point point for me as well. So when you're going through your ethics, you want to find, align yourself with uh, professors that can help you. Um, I think uh, many people said also in the chat, just having community events. I know even right now with Black History, there's a lot of community events happening. So you need to make yourself visible, be out in the space. I know it's a lot because we're also handling the work load and our own personal lives. So I think balance is important, as I mentioned in my introductory talk. But um, you know, just being in the spaces where you can go to conferences, I can definitely tell you when I started my uh, PhD back in 2016. You know, I my all my kids were very young, so I wasn't able to go to a lot of conferences. So I had to do you know just sort of create little community spaces myself with peers that were in my classes. You know, I was able to do some publications with some professors. I know I published with uh, Professor Juan. I published with uh, Professor Day. So there are little pockets of spaces where there's works happening. Um, Professor Juan spoke about even the um, the, the 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 women's uh, interviews that she did uh, with females throughout the university. And I was, I had the opportunity to work with her on that as an intern. So there are spaces um, and, you know, little pockets that you can definitely uh, ask about and become involved in as a scholar at UFT. There is so much wonderful information that you can get. And there's also offices that, uh, offices within the university that can actually support you with the things that you're going through as well. I don't think we we talk about that enough, just in terms of accommodations and stuff um, that help students. And you can find, again, people there that can help you as well when you need to balance, you know, when you're juggling so many different things and you're able to balance, uh, not able to balance everything at once. So I think that we need to continue to communicate those, uh, those uh, you know, uh, resources at the university and um, and also the amazing professors that can help uh, the students. Hopefully that helps. Well, lots of great advice, Dr. Burford. There's so much in there. Uh, thanks again uh, for your wonderful advice. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna go to our last, last word. I love this because you know, when you have the last word in church, it's always like the last word, <laughs> last word, Dr. Lopez, you requested- I'm going I love it. Your last, your question is: What barriers do Black women experience while trying to support other Black women? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. And I'm going to make it really quick. And and I just want to say, I'm I, you know, a lot of folks are talking about faith. I I'm not one who talk about faith or even have sort of do, um do do in that way in, in that kind of in that kind of space. So, um, so in terms of sort of the church of the last word, but anyway, um, I think just, just because I think we want to get to some questions from the Q&A for our audience. And I really want to just sort of quickly say, showing off for Black women in higher ed, but I also want to say just showing off for Black women. And so some of the barriers that I hopefully that we can reflect on as we leave, so I won't go into details, I'll just give nuggets. So the first one is, how do we lovingly critique each other? But what I mean by that is we're not always right. We're not always doing, getting it okay. So the question is, how do we lovingly critique? If you say something to me that creates discomfort, how do I lovingly engage in that? And so what I'm pointing at here is that as Black women, when we're intentional around supporting each other, we are going to have to find ways to lovingly navigate those tensions. And that word lovingly is intentional. The, and it also builds on my second point I want to make that Dr. Daniels talked about is having grace. Okay, so something went wrong. I wasn't quite too happy in that meeting. What do we do tomorrow? 
if if if, if Dr. Uh, uh, Butler and I are in a meeting and something you know didn't go right in that meeting, and Dr. Butler emails me and says, you know, Dr. Lopez, I really thought maybe, but I, I just could, could we just have how we how do we give grace? And these things are not theoretical things; they are practical part of our lives every day. Because as Black people, we're not a monolith. We come from different parts. We have different experiences. As I said, many people are talking about faith. That's not something that I ground my own life and experiences in. We all come with different experiences. So I think we have to, uh, in supporting each other, learn. And we also have to unlearn. And the last thing I want to say is we have to unlearn some of those white supremacy logics. I think Dr. Wynn talked about it. I think Dr. Daniels talked about it, of how we see competition. We all can shine. And how do we then support each other to shine? And I'm just going to leave it there. I think it's a good note to end on as I see Dr. ABC coming in the house so we can give our, um, our, our audience some, some, just some engagement in some of the questions that they have in the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lopez. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. ABC in a second. Um, we do have, um, we are honored this year um, to have, uh, you know, Dr. Erica Walker as the Dean of Boise. And I think this is why today's talk is especially important. So thank you again for your incredible organization of this sensational panel, Dr. ABC. Uh, over to you. Well done. Thank you so much. So we won't be taking questions from the audience, but I know you won't be upset with us because what we did, we changed the feature this year and what we had, that that buffet meal you had at the beginning, that platter of appetizer from professors, from other universities, that's what we use the time for. And I, I remember how much you all ate that up. So, so well, thank you so much. We are really gonna close on time. We have seven minutes to go. And after that seven minutes, we have six minutes for our Dean, Dean Erica Walker, who is gonna make the closing remarks. So Dean Erica Walker, it's over to you. And I'll come back with a one minute vote of thanks on behalf of the Black Faculty Caucus. Dean Erica Walker, over to you. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me, okay? Looks like the answer is yes. Thank you so much. Um, what a profound, compelling conversation we've been privileged to be part of this evening. I thank the organizers, especially Professor Andrew Campbell, for put putting together yet another successful Black faculty and conversation event at OISE. Um, I have just a few thoughts to share inspired by tonight's conversation, um, probably not six minutes long. Um, but several years ago, I was invited to contribute a paper to a volume about the history of women in mathematics over the last 100 years in the United States. And as I was writing that paper, I struggled with the title, what would do justice to all of the amazing contributions that black women had made to American mathematics over the past century? And I titled that chapter, Excellence and Devotion, Black Women in Mathematics in the United States. Excellence and devotion are two themes that came up repeatedly in that book chapter and also in the conversation tonight. Um, as I wrote in the chapter, too often Black women's contributions to academia, research, industry are undervalued and the work that we do mentoring so many is unacknowledged. How do we imagine futures and indeed um, a new present where we respect and acknowledge this hard work that too often comes as a, at a real physical, mental and emotional cost as so many panelists have described? And what can we do for Black women in our fields of influence and inquiry to reward that excellence and often this devotion to remaking the world and our educational spaces to be more fair, just, and equitable for everyone? There is work to do. And from all we've learned tonight, we have some blueprints to incorporate in our work at OISE and U of T going forward. I'm excited about that. And I thank our panelists and moderators for such a rich, rich discussion. As we leave tonight, I hope you'll reflect on who are the Black women that inspire you and why. Um, for me, Black women from the past who are, who are now our ancestors, who inspire me and influence how I move in this world include Fannie Lou Hamer, Etta Faulkner, Ida B. Wells, Denise Tomasos, and my own aunt, Miss Eddie Lee Price. And I know like me, you have been greatly inspired tonight by Professor Joki Wan, Dr. Natasha Buffert, Dr. Marie Green, Professor Linda Wainafu, Professor Shauna K. Tucker, Professor Ann Lopez, and Professor Alana Butler. 
My great thanks to these wonderful women of Oise, to all of our panelists and participants, especially the Black Women Showing Up speakers, and to all of you for joining us this evening. What a wonderful, fulfilling time we've had. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Walker. What a feast. What a feast. What an evening. I just want to say thanks to everyone. And there's a lot was said tonight. And I want to say something very special as we close. Please listen to our, our, our my vote of thanks. There's something you said, um, Shauna, um, Kay, Tucker, Professor Tucker, that really resonates with me more than maybe you'll ever know. And sometimes you, it's kind of surprising what will resonate with someone. We have to be, we have to be the change. We have heard it a million times. How many times have we heard it that we just say it? And we're talking about the ways black women are showing up in university, in higher ed, in community. And many of you are pushing against that. And I'm really thank you for that, for showing up and leading the example, for saying, for refusing, for refusing and for taking rest and for not carrying the weight. And then 10 years from now, we're going to come back here and say the same thing that we carried the weight for 10 years. January the 1st, 2024, I made a statement on social media, you know, that's the kind of person I am. And I was very bold, very strong. And the number of person it resonated with when I said, I will never be your black, underworked, overworked, underappreciated employee and I'm walking into that. I'm walking into that in Oise. I'm walking into that in community. And that's why I'm very big and, and very clear on my black joy and my health. And I want to encourage everyone who is listening that if we continue to do that, what the things we say we want to disrupt, then we are only contributing to the colonial logic of why we want to disrupt it ourselves and we cannot do that. So we have to take a stand from our hearts. I just want to say thanks to everyone. Juliet for the, Juliet Allen, Professor Juliet Allen from, from Humber for the grounding, Merva, Tanitia Monroe, Professor Joki Wan, you, 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 you brought us. You brought us into the space. The ground, I don't know if you realize, Professor Wan, but the grounding and your introduction was like this. It was, it was powerful and it almost like a reflection. So thank you so much for your voice. For the buffet of appetizer we had from speakers from other universities. Dr. Wendy McKay, Dr. Dr. Um, Sharon Jordan, Dr. Kamisha Siblis, Dr. Beverly Jean Daniel, Deborah Peer, Dr. Cheryl Thompson, Deborah McCannon Walford, and Sharon et al. Voices outside showing up. That was powerful. That was powerful. Our panel tonight, Linda, Marie, Natasha, Anne, Shauna, and our moderator, Alana Butler. Thank you so much for how you talked about. And I hope the audience are walking away, listening to the kind of connections and the kind of stories and the ways we have been showing up for each other. And there's so much more that we need to do and we can do. I just want to say thank you for that. I also want to say thank you to the people behind the scene. You see, when you have a, a big event like this and it is so good, just remember, it's not the Dr. Campbell who is talking at the mic. That is the star of the show. The star of the show is behind. And I want to say big up, big up to you, Sim Kapoor, Perry King, Neil Thinker, and, Mar and Mariana. Let me tell you something, and I said this with a lot of emotions, and they know this. They have supported me in ways that that's why my journey is like this. That is why my journey. And I want to say to all of you who are in the audience and your allies and you don't self-identify as black. That is your that is your power. That is how you show up in allyship. You help me to shine. And I've said it publicly. When you see me shining, I have said it many times. The persons who are helping me to shine. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, sorry, Sim. Thank you, Perry. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Mariana, for helping me to shine. Thank you so much. And audience, community. This is why we need this. Dr. Lopez, this is why we keep fighting for this. Dr. Joki Wan, this is why we keep fighting for this. We had a 195 person showed up at the beginning and the numbers went up and down because community members, they are cooking their dinner. Some are being mothering. Some are doing what they're doing and they're in and out. But look what has happened to the last word. We still have over 142 community members. This is why we are here. This is our calling. I know we are fabulous. Come on now. We are fabulous. But our calling is not just to be fabulous. Our calling is to walk within community in our research, in our teaching, in our practice, in our pedagogy, in our pol policies, and in just in our presence. I just want to say thank you so much. And guess what? 
Imagine we as a team here at the Black Caucus having also a Black Dean. Thank you, Dr. Um, Professor Dr. Dean Erica Walker for showing up. Dean Erica Walker has something called the Dean Salon. I talk our business. You are going to hear more about it. It is one of the juicy, juicy events I've been. And when I'm sure, I'm, I'm putting her on the spot, but I'm sure she's going to make an opportunity someday to open that salon, even one episode to community, because community need to come into the Dean Salon and listen how the dean does her stuff and it's it's amazing so thank you so much dean for creating space not just for faculty but also extending to community the last thing i'm going to say before i go is that the black caucus of oise is doing amazing and i want to mention the name of the other caucus members if you wonder who they are they are professor george day professor key alexander professor rosalind ampton professor lance mccready Professor Roy Moodley, Professor Fikele, and Professor Amal Madibo. These are also our amazing Black Caucus members, and I know you know them. Nuff love, nuff love, nuff love. I am full. I don't know about you. Normally, I come off, I'm going to watch TV. I don't think I'm going to watch TV tonight. I'm going to have a drink, of, of course. I'm going to have a drink, of course. I must. <laughs> but I am full. Thank you so much, community. Have yourself a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Enough love, community. Enough love, enough love. Thank you to Dr. ABC. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. When love, made Professor Mackey. I'm coming back to, to your area, okay? <laughs> Listen, I got space for you, everybody here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ABC. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Bye. Bye-bye.